So open source zones are a whole different kettle of fish. <coughs> so as I mentioned before, zones are lightweight virtualization at the operating system level. Now what that means is it's built into the operating system um, at the kernel level. So it's not just an application that you're running on your system. Now, you're only going to see zones on Solaris 10 or Open Solaris. Uh, remember, Solaris 10 is the enterprise version of Solaris, whereas Open Solaris is the, the free version. Speaking of Open Solaris, is there anyone here who needs an Open Solaris CD? Or have you all got one? You? Go. Have yourself an Open Solaris CD. Um, if anyone else needs one, just grab one. Okay, so. Um, You'll only see this on Solaris 10 or Open Solaris, although on BSD there's a feature called Jails, um, which is very, very similar from what I hear. I know nothing about it, but I'm throwing that out there. Um, so the way that zones work is that you have multiple operating system instances, but they all share one kernel. So the kernel is the part of the um, operating system that handles all the low-level stuff, like processor scheduling, memory management, all that kind of stuff, device drivers. All of that stuff is shared with zones. You can have lots of different operating systems running, all instances of open Solaris, but they're all sharing one kernel. Um, so that's actually got a lot of benefits because it saves you having the overhead of trying to catch all the low level calls that an operating system makes, which is what stuff like VirtualBox has to do. Normally, stuff that runs in either what's called user mode on an, an Intel or Intel compatible CPU. Um, and then there's real mode stuff. Um, there's a sort of ring architecture. And what a virtual machine, um, or sorry, a, a virtualization application has to do is it has to intercept all the low level real mode stuff that's talking to the actual um, hardware and emulate what a system would normally do. Um, you don't have that problem with this because it's just talking to the kernel. It's using the same kernel instance um, across all the operating systems. So you don't have that overhead, and that actually makes a big difference to performance. Um, you'll see that like VirtualBox runs open Slash pretty damn slowly, and it was taking a long time to boot that Linux CD. Also saves some disk space. Um, obviously, if you're all sharing the same kernel, you're using the same file systems, essentially. So you don't have to have you know, a complete installation of each operating system on a bunch of different partitions. Um, from my point of view, the best bit is it saves a hassle because it's a pain in the neck setting up a whole bunch of different operating systems going through that install routine over and over and over again. So what those do is they build on other open source uh, technologies as well. So ZFS is tightly integrated, as you'll see. Um, IPS is used for setting it up. So IPS is the image packaging system, which is Solaris package manager. SMF, I'm pretty sure, has a hand in starting them up and shutting them down and so on. So how do they work? They install into the road ZFS file system, so you create a ZFS um, file system out of some pool on your system, um, and you give that to your zone. Um, on Solaris 10, you can also run it on UFS, but that doesn't appear to be an option anymore in, in Open Solaris. Um, you set it up from the host off, so you don't need an install CD. Um, you do, however, appear to need an internet connection. Um, when you're setting up from Open Solaris. It's not required for Solaris 10, but it is required for Open Solaris because what it does is it pulls down updated packages from IPS um, and uses them to set up your new uh, OS. Now, those are the stats. So you need 90 megs of disk space per zone that you set up, 40 megs of RAM for each zone that you set up. That's on top of the RAM that you already need for running Open Solaris itself, which is about 5, 12 megs, something like that. Um, theoretically, that's a very theoretical number, and um, that's the maximum number that it will actually let you create. If you actually try and run 8,000 zones in a system, I don't think they're going to run very fast. Uh, not unless you've got one of these Sun Enterprise servers that's got 2 terabytes of RAM and weighs 2.5 metric tons. I'm not joking, we do actually have a server that weighs 2.5 metric tons. Um, so, that obviously hammer's home point that you don't have those overheads of setting up a normal virtual machine. You saw the sizes of the virtual disks that I was handing over to VirtualBox just there. You know, multiple gigs. Uh, Nightmares is a lot more manageable. Um, so a zone is a self-sufficient OS. It's got its own login details, so you can create your own users. It's got its own root account. Um, it's got its own network interface, so you can give it an IP address. 
um, which is completely separate from the host operating system. Um, and what that does is it just shares the physical interface that you've got. And you can actually choose which network, network interface you want. So if you've got multiple network interfaces, say on a server um, or on a desktop system, you can give one network interface to one zone and keep the other for the global zone. Um, it's got its own file systems, but obviously they are shared from the global zone. So what it can actually do is it can reuse things like the var file system, um, which contains um, actually no wind feature var. That's complete rubbish. The, the USR file system, which contains all the binaries and stuff, um, or what other ones would it share? On? You can share exports, so you've all got the same home directories, that kind of thing. Um, and you can boot up and shut down zones independently of the global zone. The global zone is the host operating system. It's the actual the, the operating system that's running on the hardware. <coughs> um, you can also do quite tight resource management. Um, so if you want to really limit what each zone is able to do in terms of stealing all your CPU, you can do that. Um, what I was planning to do was actually doing that live when with Jason here so that I could limit him to like, you know, 1% of my CPU or something, but he's not here, which is very upsetting. Um, so what you can do is you can assign full CPUs to zones so that they have their own dedicated CPU, or you can use what, um, what that is, is the fair share scheduler. Um, fair share scheduler, can't stay that, it's like a tongue twister. Um, what that does is it makes sure that um, each zone or each user um, on a system gets an equal share of CPU resources so that you don't have one guy you know, running his project or whatever and stealing all the CPU speeds. It's maybe not the sort of thing that you're going to do on your laptop if you're using this just to test out some, some software or whatever. Um, but it's, it's useful to know about if you're running um, servers. I'm going to need to take a drink because I'm drying up here. Now there's a beta feature which is called Brand Z. So you can have different types of zones. You can have zones which emulate older versions of Solaris. You can have um, just normal zones. You have iPackage zones, which are the new type of zones that you use under Open Solaris. Um, and you can also have Brand Z. Now this isn't a f this is more of an experimental feature than something you'd actually use in a production server or whatever. But what it can do is it can emulate a Linux um, kernel under Open Solaris. So you've got an open slash zone, but it's running Linux basically, you can run Linux binaries on top of that. I've never tried it, so I don't know how stable it is. Um, I don't think it's very stable. Uh, but it is there if you want to play with it.